Looks is subjective. Business is not. Which is why this year, instead of a top 10 worst list of movies, I thought it would be a lot more accurate and a heck of a lot juicier to do the top 10 career killers instead. Well, maybe careers were just maimed, but still, it's not looking good. Can this talent and these franchises survive? Share your own diagnoses or prognoses down below uh, as we go over the top 10 career killers of 2022. There's nothing worse than a one-two punch. You're sent reeling, but before you can recover, bam, you get hit again. And there were two of those in 2022 in Hollywood. Fittingly, two in 2022. The first is Disney Animation, where the studio that started it all and the CGI studio that started it all that they acquired both took direct hits. Some would argue they punched themselves in the face. All right, so first it was Lightyear. How does Pixar botch its defining franchise? They messed up Toy Story. Seems like there's a lot of that going on at Disney's, the, Disney these days, though, across the board, as Disney allows behind-the-scenes talent to drastically change formulas, formulas that every other studio covets uh, and that have worked for decades, but to change those so that they're unrecognizable and in some case, well, I wouldn't say they're broken because they could be fixed. They could be fixed. You know, you tweak, you tweak so that it's done subtly and organically and the audience doesn't even know where you're taking them until they're already there. And then they say, we love it here, actually. Thanks for taking us here. That's how you do it. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of box checking, checking boxes going on over at uh, Disney, unfortunately. Uh, the, uh, so... Pixar is so concerned with message, something we used to make fun of them for, but now it's become quite serious because it's all that they do. I mean, they, it, it used to be like the secret ingredient which helped them win so many Oscars and have so many adult fans, but now you can see the strings attached. They're trying too hard. They wanted too much, and they forgot how to have fun. Movies are entertainment after all. And they also forgot why fans love Toy Story. Again, their defining franchise, where the last couple of entries have been billion dollar hits, even when they weren't even as good as the originals. But now, uh, Lightyear is Pixar's lowest grossing film ever in 27 years, with the exception of Onward, but that was released at the very, very beginning of the pandemic. Like right when the pandemic started in uh, the West, Onward hit theaters. Uh, I rem actually remember going to see that and how weird it was. Uh, who took a hit besides Pixar itself? Well, that would be writer-director Angus McLean. So much for being Pixar's resident Buzz Lightyear expert. Woo! Sometimes you can fly too close to the sun. And then I would also say Chris Evans. You know, they replaced Tim Allen for Chris Evans. They were like, Captain America, how can we lose? And they lost big. Captain America, like a lot of his fellow Avengers, continues to have problems selling tickets outside of Marvel. And also, Evans is aggressively political. Some of that might have rubbed off on this production, in fact. And that's fine, but Evans has to understand that the trade-off for that is limiting the broad appeal that a movie star is supposed to have. So, I mean, even if you want to get bogged down in message, the, the movie just isn't particularly good, and it's not a lot of fun. So, uh, I mean, I respected it for what it was, but it's not what a Buzz Lightyear movie should have been. Two, so, so then, as, as Disney was reeling the second hit, there goes the other animation house, uh, Disney Animation itself, where it seems the Pixar mindset has spread. Strange World is also more message than fun. And speaking of one-two punches, both these movies dealt a significant blow to LGBT representation, uh, as well as you know the other things that we're discussing. You're gonna see LGBT, LGBT representation, unfortunately, a lot in this discussion. And every time, it's not the representation, I would argue, but the quality of the pro product projects that it's being done in. Such representation, unfortunately, is still very tricky to do. So if you want it to work, everything else has to go just right. But nothing's going right. These are bad movies. But at least Lightyear told a coherent story while Strange World is really just, you can see the boxes being checked. Similar to Disney Plus's Cheaper by the Dozen remake, which also came out this year. Strange World, even without adjusting for inflation, is the lowest grossing film in the history of Disney animation, which has been making movies since 1937. That is an impressive, that's really an impressive failure. Who takes a hit here? Director Don Hall and new Disney animation writer, uh, Kui Gwynn 
Sure, he worked on Raya, and I loved Raya, right? But uh, he's gonna, he's, he's, so he's not totally out. I think I'll keep him, but I think they're gonna watch him a heck of a lot more closely, and he's not gonna be allowed to write anything by himself anymore. Uh, also, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal continues not to be able to sell tickets either outside of the MCO. Jake Gyllenhaal, nobody wants to see him for some reason, even though he's very talented. And Gab- uh, Gabriel Union is zero for two, because she also starred in that Cheaper by the Dozen remake. Uh, With these two misfires, Best Animated Feature is now wide open for another studio to snatch it up. As we all know, animation is fiercely competitive these days. It has been for a while now. But so far, Disney or Pixar, Team Disney, has managed to nab the Oscar, the Best Animated Feature Oscar, a little over 50% of the time since the category was introduced in 1992. But not this year! Not this year. Oh, so bad. All right, then our other one-two punch is poor Margot Robbie, who is trying so hard to win an Oscar, but it is going oh so badly. In her defense, you would think this would be a banner year for her, starring in both David O. Russell and Damien Chazelle's latest films. But not only have both films bombed at the box office, but critics hate them, as do audiences. They got nothing going for them, nothing. Robbie already has two Oscar nominations and got a Golden Globe and Critics' Choice nomination for Best Actress for Babylon. However, both of those awards have more than five spots for Best Actress, while the Oscars, of course, only has five. So we'll see if she can land her third Oscar nomination. And who knows? It's a weird year. Maybe even a win. If she wins, this will all have been worth it. Who cares? She'll step on these. She'll take these two hits for the gold, right? It's rough out there. (laughs) But if she doesn't win, even if she's nominated, perhaps she should take a break from pursuing an Oscar. She's already got, she would have two to three noms and focus on shoring up her box office track record and Rotten Tomato scores before trying for for that Oscar again. Here's hoping that she can turn things around with Barbie. Who else takes a hit for these flops? I know a lot of you are like, why is it just all on Margot Robbie? It's not, even though she unfortunately has become the face of these two flops. But on Amsterdam, it looks like David O. Russell's bad attitude has finally caught up with him, as he is no longer the golden, a golden boy in the eyes of the film elite and, you know, film circles. They, you know, really, they used to be like, oh, David O. Russell, you came up with something, you did something. Now they're like, we don't even want to hear from you, buddy. And yet here's another shining example of of why studios would prefer to cast Leonardo DiCaprio, but then have to settle for Christian Bale if Leonardo DiCaprio turns that down. I thought it was hilarious that Christian Bale actually revealed that all of his roles are first offered to Leonardo DiCaprio, because you're like, I know why, Christian Bale. I'm surprised you would want to make, you know, bring that up in people's, uh, the general public's uh, mind. And it's also not great for John David Washington, who's trying to build his own career. Then with Babylon, Damien Chazelle blew all of his La La Land capital. He snorted it up like the cocaine in his movie, his new movie. And uh, it's just gone like that. He will have to prove himself with another low-budget film before anyone gives him another big budget like this one and carte blanche creative control. This is just not going to happen again. And Brad Pitt continues to be a gamble. Sometimes he delivers at the box office, but sometimes he does not. He already has his Oscar, though, and he's already talking about retirement. Maybe it is time, Brad. Maybe it is time. Uh, So those are the one-two punches. Now let's take a look at some single knockouts. Well, not quite. Black Adam took out two people. Uh, It was a juicy implosion, though, especially because The Rock bet so much on it personally, as to Henry Cavill, actually. But The Rock showed his hand and then lost his cool. And Henry Cavill aggressively uh, tried to to force Warner Brothers' hand, and it really blew up in his face. Uh, Dwayne Johnson's The Hierarchy is About to Change at DC line will haunt him forever, especially because he wasn't just fighting to take to make Black Adam 2, but to control DC films itself. And for a hot minute, it looked like he had the upper hand, moving mountains and achieving the impossible, getting Henry Cavill back in that super suit. But even though fans had booed The Rock at Comic-Con when it seemed he wouldn't be able to get Cavill back, Fans still didn't show up at the box office when he did bring back Cavill, and Black Adam ended up delivering Shazam-level numbers, even though The Rock had felt he was too big for Shazam, even though he is playing Shazam's villain. So bizarre! Black Adam took out The Rock and Henry Cavill, with new DC co-head James Gunn, where are you, Peter Safran, uh, cutting both loose. Oh, I'm sorry, giving them a break. Oh, we just, we're, you know, we're going in a different direction. <laughs> And since Dwayne Johnson made Black Adam all about him and Henry Cavill, they and their manager slash business partner Danny Garcia are the ones taking the hit here. And they kind of 
have put the final nail in the coffin of the Snyderverse. Uh, but this is one of the few films on this list where the talent is so big and their heart was also so big. I mean, they failed with love that I think that, and they really have still, I think, have a lot of fans that both The Rock and Henry Cavill will live to fight another day. Maybe together. It just won't be for DC. All right, then back to LGBT, LGBT representation. Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore didn't do that representation any favors either, despite a lovely nuanced performance from Jude Law. And again, the problem was that the film is poorly made with a design flaw from conception. The juicy storyline, Dumbledore and Grindelwald is secondary to Newt Scamander and his, quite frankly, not very interesting, fa not very fantastic friends. <laughs> fantastic Beasts, boring beasts. Except Jacob Kowalski and Queenie Goldstein. They are an absolute delight, and I'm rooting for, the, for them. They're trying to have a serious conversation about magical Nazis and a torrid, doomed adult romance, but then these cute little animals keep popping up. J.K. Rowling wanted to have her cake and eat it too, tell more adult stories, but keep the franchise friendly to very small children. It's like trying to give Indiana Jones a talking pet. Ain't nobody want to see that. Uh, speaking of having her cake and eat it too, J.K. Rowling also thought that she could have strong opinions, you know, to some degree political ones online, and there would be no repercussions. That did not work out for her either. Uh, she also felt she was a screenwriter, and she's clearly not a screenwriter. Uh, has she taken the Wizarding World down with her? We'll see what Warner Brothers Discovery, or whoever buys Warner Brothers in 2024 when Discovery can legally put it back up for sale, what they can salvage. But in the meantime... We're never going to find out how this story ends because the final two films and the five that were promised have been canceled. So who takes the hit? Well, obviously, J.K. Rowling, Eddie Redmayne. Blockbusters are not for him. Uh, and Ezra Miller gets another, yet another strike against him. And consider this a warning to anyone else who thinks they might want to make a Johnny Depp movie without Johnny Depp. If you don't want to hire Johnny Depp, don't make a Johnny Depp movie. Uh, as women try to break new ground in Hollywood and find equal footing with their male counterparts, it is so frustrating to see many of them take themselves out. And here, you can add to that list Olivia Wilde with Don't Worry Darling. Now, the film itself actually isn't that bad. And while it doesn't totally work, Wilde, from a creative standpoint, delivers, including some gutsy creative risks that she takes, which you have to admire, even if they do miss the mark. I thought it was a good movie. I mean, I know some people who hated it, so I understand that. But I liked it. And again, creatively, I respect it. But Wilde bought into her own hype and was shockingly unprofessional, both while filming and then while promoting the film. At first, everyone was on her side when she was blindsided by that process server at CinemaCon, blaming her ex Jason Sudeikis for serving her with custody papers at an industry event. But then it all began to unravel when she said in an interview to promote the movie that she'd fired Shia LaBeouf, only for LaBeouf to have kept the receipts and release video of her, not only begging him to come back to the movie, but throwing Florence Pugh under the bus in the hopes of convincing him. Oh, it was bad. It was so bad. Pugh instantly shut down her connection to the film, refusing to promote it, while rumors swirled that Pugh, a friend of Sudeikis through her own ex, Zach Braff, was also upset about Wilde's onset affair with Harry Styles, feeling it was not only cruel, but put her in a really difficult position. And suddenly, everyone was back on Ted Lasso's side. And it just got worse from there. Remember Spitgate when the film premiered at the Venice Film Festival? Critics turned on the movie, then the media, and it was just DOA. Who takes the hit? Olivia Wilde, who is unlikely to ever be trusted by a big studio again. Maybe someday, but it's going to take a lot of healing and proving that she can, she won't, she's going to have to prove on smaller independent films that she has more of a handle again. But she's just walking around on red carpets like, like nothing happened, and it's bizarre. And Harry Styles, she's on those red carpets alone, because Harry Styles, who became the other man, quickly broke up with Wilde after the movie bombed, but the damage to his, his film career, I believe, has been done. His inane interviews at the Venice Film Festival also did not help him. By the way, interestingly, surviving this debacle with class just made fans love Chris Pine and Pew even more. Oh, they were so wonderful, hilarious. Uh, and before you say a male director wouldn't have suffered like Wilde, I give you Taika Waititi on Thor Love and Thunder. Watiti was also snapped, getting very cozy and intimate with his actors while filming, and he delivered a four-hour cut that Kevin Feige was forced to whittle down to an incomprehensible under-two-hour fluff piece. Watiti managed to bungle two 
new classic and beloved Thor storylines. While Natalie Portman proved to have not improved at all as Jane Foster, just as wooden as she was in her first two films. Go sit next to Eddie Redmayne. You guys should not be in blockbusters. Uh, Watiti was coming off of a high with Thor Ragnarok and his Oscar for the, uh, the, for the Jojo Rabbit script. But like Damien Chazelle, he also blew all his capital. It's gone. Despite teeing up Thor 5, aggressively so, there hasn't been any mention of another Thor film, except Chris Hemsworth saying he'd like to go in a different direction next. Ouch, that's so bad! Chris Hemsworth even turned on him, and he turned Chris Hemsworth's Thor career around. There wouldn't have been a fourth Thor if it weren't for Taika Waititi. But again, he blew all that capital. So the only person I think taking a hit here is Taika Waititi, who looks to have also maybe lost his Star Wars movie. He and Patty Jenkins can commiserate, both having delivered comic book films so poorly received that Kathleen Kennedy, of all people, lost their contact info. She's like, I can't take any more hits either. Get away from me! Also, maybe poor Brett Goldstein, speaking of Ted Lasso, whose Blink and You Miss It debut as Hercules might be all he gets. I thought it was brilliant casting, but a lot of people did not react well to that casting. I think not enough people, unfortunately, watched Ted Lasso. If you did, you would be as un on cloud nine as I was. All right, two, two left, two career killers left. How can we have this discussion and not talk about Morbius? A lot of us in the press tried to defend Morbius, but speaking of vampires, most of you are out for blood. Oh, you guys really came after this movie. You see, while fans were divided over his Joker, it seems Leto's fate has now been decided, with everyone turning on him for his Gucci role, Morbius, and totally ignoring We Crashed, where he was very good, I feel. I thought he was good in all that stuff. Allegations against Leto, though, have begun to resurface, and he, beca he has become, I think, persona non grata with fans, and now perhaps in Hollywood. I'd be scared to cast him at this point. Taking the hit here is clearly Leto, but also director Daniel Espinosa, who was lucky to even get this gig considering his past movies, and Sony's Spider-Verse out outside of Tom Holland's MCU-connected movies. And with their upcoming slate, it seems things are only going to get worse, if that's even possible. Thankfully, Matt Smith had already signed on for a little show called House of the Dragon, so he's just fine. And then, finally, Bros. Ah, the first LGBT romantic comedy to ever come out of Hollywood. Only, of course, it wasn't. That was a ridiculous claim. Yes, Bros itself was a harmless, bland film, but the big disaster here was Billy Eichner himself. So unwilling to accept responsibility for his total lack of self-awareness as a writer and an actor that he'd rather brand the entire world as against the LGBT community even though many people in the LGBT community didn't even go and see this movie. And again, LGBT representation seems to take a hit when in fact it was just bad filmmaking and very poor showmanship from Eichner. This is also a blow for Judd Apatow, uh, ruining his streak as a comedic kingmaker. He even made Pete Davidson happen, Pete Davidson. But with this and his own The Bubble on Netflix crashing and burning in 2022, he seems to have lost his touch. So those are the career killers, or at least maimers, of uh, 2022. What do you think? Does anyone here still have a pulse? Share your thoughts down below, and how, how would you resuscitate them? Oh, I'm having fun with this metaphor. Uh, feel free to carry on the fun down below. Share those thoughts uh, down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.